am concerned that so much of what the government does places a special hardship on the small business owner. He is less apt to be able to absorb higher taxes and increased wage rates, and he is less able to bear the burdens of tight federal regulations and increased paperwork. Well-intentioned environmental and consumer legislation can cause him severe problems that leave him hovering on the brink of bankruptcy. Our governmental actions fall with great force upon the small business owner and I am persuaded he needs relief and special attention. Okay, let's try another one. What's the brief for economic? KMIK or KMEK, either one, right? Um, how about business? Mm -hmm. um, what's percent? Mm -hmm. Government? Mm -hmm. Let's see, what else? Um, manufacturing? Mm -hmm. Majority? Two strokes? Right? Majority? Okay, here we go. In economic terms, the positive impact of the small business is enormous. Small businesses comprise 98% of the country's total business units. They employ 65% of the nation's non-governmental workforce and produce about 40% of our gross national product. Despite these contributions, small businesses are losing ground rapidly and disastrously to larger firms in terms of market share, assets, and profits. In the great majority of manufacturing industries, we have studied the largest companies accounted for 40% or more of the value of the goods that were shipped. <clears throat> What's the for industry? Street. Okay. Let's try that one again. But faster. In economic terms, the positive impact of the small business is enormous. Small businesses comprise 98% of the country's total business units. They employ 65% of the nation's non-governmental workforce and produce about 40% of our gross national product. Despite these contributions, small businesses are losing ground rapidly and disastrously 
to larger firms in terms of market share, assets, and profits in the great majority of manufacturing industries we have studied the largest companies accounted for 40 percent or more of the value of the goods that were shipped one more time on this one here we go. I'll try it again. I think it a little bit faster. Yeah. <clears throat> Despite these contributions, businesses are losing ground rapidly and disastrously to larger firms in terms of market share, assets, and profits in the great majority of manufacturing industries we have studied the largest companies accounted for 40 percent or more of the value of the goods that were shipped government is doing nothing to level the playing field a small business owner may be required to fill out as many as 75 to 80 different types of forms in the course of a year. For a business with a small office staff, and especially for the mom and pop stores, completion of these forms is a tremendously time-consuming, frustrating, and costly operation. Unlike large corporations, they cannot rely on in-house accountants or tax lawyers to handle this work. They must do it themselves while running their businesses and while serving their customers. I am quite concerned by developments that so adversely affect small business owners whose situation remains tenuous. I am concerned that so much of what the government does places a special hardship on the small business owner. He is less apt to be able to absorb higher taxes and increased wage rates. And he is less able to bear the burdens of tight federal regulations and increased paperwork. Well-intentioned environmental and consumer legislation can cause him severe problems that leave him hovering on the brink of bankruptcy. Our governmental actions fall with great force upon the small business owner and I am persuaded he needs relief and special attention. In economic terms, the positive impact of the small business is enormous. Small businesses comprise 98% of the country's total business units. They employ 65% of the nation's non-governmental workforce and produce about 40% of our gross national product. 
despite these contributions, small businesses are losing ground rapidly and disastrously to larger firms in terms of market share, assets, and profits. In the great majority of manufacturing industries we have studied, the largest companies accounted for 40% or more of the value of the goods that were shipped. Government is doing nothing to level the playing field. A small business owner may be required to fill out as many as 75 to 80 different types of forms in the course of a year. For a business with a small office staff, and especially for the mom and pop stores, completion of these forms is a tremendously time-consuming, frustrating, and costly operation. Unlike large corporations, they cannot rely on in-house accountants or tax lawyers to handle this work. They must do it themselves while running their businesses and while serving their customers. I am quite concerned by developments that so adversely affect small business owners whose situation remains tenuous. Your name is Edward King? That is correct. You are a police officer with the Chicago Police Department. That is correct. You are assigned to District 7. Is that correct? I am presently assigned to the Training and Education Center. Pardon me. On July 16 of this year, you were assigned to District 7. Is that correct? That is correct. What shift were you working on that particular day? On the 16th of July? Yes, we were working the 11 to 7 or the third shift. That would be going from July 16 into the morning of July 17. That is correct. Hunterite District. Your name is Edward King. That is correct. You are a police officer with the Chicago Police Department. That is correct. You are assigned to District 7. Is that correct? I am presently assigned to the training and education section. Pardon me, on July 16 of this year, you were assigned to District 7. Is that correct? That is correct. What shift were you working on that particular day? On the 16th of July, yes, 
we were working the 11 to 7 for the third shift. So that would be going from July 16 into the morning of July 17. That is correct. Officer King, directing your attention to approximately a quarter to one on July 17 of this year, did you respond to a police broadcast directing police officers to the Liberty Drug Store at Ridge and Howard? I did. Where were you when you first heard that broadcast? I was in a marked police vehicle located in the area of Devon and Western. <clears throat> Your name is Edward King. That is correct. You are a police officer with the Chicago Police Department. That is correct. You are assigned to District 7. Is that correct? I am presently assigned to the Training and Education section. Pardon me. On July 16 of this year, you were assigned to District 7. Is that correct? That is correct. What shift were you working on that particular day? On the 16th of July, yes, we were working the 11 to 7 or the third shift. That would be going from July 16 into the morning of July 17. That is correct. Okay, space up, let's do one for Rebecca. Okay, ready? Let's place vehicle. All right, this is for Rebecca. Officer King, directing your attention to approximately a quarter to one on July 17 of this year, did you respond to a police broadcast directing police officers to the Liberty Drug Store at Ridge and Howard? I did. Where were you when you first heard that broadcast? I was in a marked police vehicle located in the area of Devon and Western. Do you know what time that broadcast came over the air. The exact time I do not remember. How long did it take you to get from where you were to the area of the Liberty Drug Store, approximately four minutes. When you arrived there, were other police officers present? Yes, sir, there were. Could you estimate how many were there? There were at least two officers on the roof 
of the drugstore and there was one officer in the alley alongside the store. When you were at the drugstore, did you hear another broadcast concerning this incident? Yes, sir, I did. What was that broadcast? That broadcast concerned two individuals who were running south on Ridge. When you heard that broadcast, what, if anything, did you do? I started to return to my police vehicle. Did, um, Oh, what's the brief for what, if anything? Wayne, Wayne. W-H-A. I-N-G. That was huge. Yeah. Okay. What, if anything, did you see? Prior to seeing anything, I heard another broadcast. What was that broadcast? That was a broadcast from Officer Mitchell, who said that he had an injured police officer in the street. You continued going south. That is correct. What did you see? I saw a police vehicle parked at the curb with the engine running. Immediately to the rear of this vehicle, I saw a police officer tending a second police officer who was lying on his back in the street. Were there any lights on the police car? Yes, sir. Did you know the officer who was lying on his back? Yes, sir. I did. Who was he? He was Officer Dennis. What, if anything, did you do? Immediately upon arriving at the scene, I went to the officer who was lying on the ground. Officer Mitchell was attending Officer Dennis. An ambulance had been summoned. It came promptly. Officer Dennis was placed on the stretcher and he was removed from the scene. Did you recover or did you pick up any personal items belonging to Officer Dennis? The only item that I came in contact with at the time was his revolver, which was handed to me by Officer Taft. To whom did you give that revolver? I gave the revolver to Specialist Kelly of the Homicide Squad. Did you examine the revolver before you gave it to Specialist Kelly? The only examination I made was a visual one. The only thing I can say is there was powder emitting from the cylinders. All right, let's try the whole thing, all three of them, okay? 
Your name is Edward King. That is correct. You are a police officer with the Chicago Police Department. That is correct. You are assigned to District 7. Is that correct? I am presently assigned to the Training and Education section. Pardon me. On July 16 of this year, you were assigned to District 7. Is that correct? That is correct. What shift were you working on that particular day? On the 16th of July? Yes, we were working the 11 to 7 or the third shift. That would be going from July 16 into the morning of July 17. That is correct. Officer King, directing your attention to approximately a quarter to one on July 17 of this year, did you respond to a police broadcast directing police officers to the Liberty Drug Store at Ridge and Howard? I did. Where were you when you first heard that broadcast? I was in a marked police vehicle located in the area of Devon and Western. Do you know what time that broadcast came over the air? The exact time I do not remember how did you get from where you were to the area of the Liberty Drug Store. Approximately four minutes. When you arrived there, were other police officers present? Yes, sir, there were. Could you estimate how many were there? There were at least two officers on the roof of the drug store, and there was one officer in the alley alongside the store. When you were at the drug store, did you hear another broadcast concerning this incident? Yes, sir, I did. What was that broadcast? That broadcast concerned two individuals who were running south on Ridge. When you heard the broadcast, what, if anything, did you do? I started to return to my police vehicle. What, if anything, did you hear or see at that time? I heard a sound, but I couldn't distinguish what it was. Following that sound, I heard what seemed to be three or four shots in rapid succession. What did you do when you heard the shots? I entered my police vehicle and started to drive south on Ridge. It made my task so much easier. My task, as you know, consists to a great extent in presiding at the sessions of the trial and maintaining decorum in keeping the trial going without any undue delay and making such rulings as may be required while the trial goes on, 
particularly in ruling on the admission of items offered in evidence. And now the last portion of my duty consists in outlining for you the rules of law which obtain in this situation and which are to be your guide in performing the final act that you are to perform. You must understand as you have been told time and again that in this field of law I am supreme that is at least as far as this courtroom is concerned. If I should make an error in stating the law of this case, there are courts of review that exist for the purpose of correcting me. It is not your function to try to correct any error that any one of you may think I am making in telling you what the law is. Nor is it your province to disagree with the law. If you should decide the law is bad in any respect as I give it to you, you are duty bound under your oath to accept the law as I give it to you and to follow it. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, before I actually get into the charge itself, I think I ought to say to both of the gentlemen who have appeared here in this case that I fully appreciate the way in which they have conducted themselves throughout this trial. It made my task so much easier. My task, as you know, consists to a great extent in presiding at the sessions of the trial and maintaining decorum in keeping the trial going without any undue delay and making such rulings as may be required while the trial goes on, particularly in ruling on the admission of items offered in evidence. And now, the last portion of my duty consists in outlining for you the rules of law which obtain in this situation and which are to be your guide in performing the final act that you are to perform. You must understand, as you have been told time and again, that in this field of law, I am supreme. That is at least as far as this courtroom is concerned. If I should make an error in stating the law of this case, 
There are courts of review that exist for the purpose of correcting me. It is not your function to try to correct any error that any one of you may think I am making in telling you what the law is, nor is it your province to disagree with the law. If you should decide the law is bad in any respect as I give it to you, you are duty bound under your oath to accept the law as I give it to you and to follow it. Okay, space up. Let's do one for readback. Okay, ready? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, before I actually get into the charge itself, I think I ought to say to both of the gentlemen who have appeared here in this case that I fully appreciate the way in which they have conducted themselves throughout this trial. It made my task so much easier. My task, as you know, consists to a great extent in presiding at the sessions of the trial and maintaining decorum in keeping the trial going without any undue delay and making such rulings as may be required while the trial goes on, particularly in ruling on the admission of items offered in evidence. And now the last portion of my duty consists in outlining for you the rules of law which obtain in this situation and which are to be your guide in performing the final act that you are to perform. You must understand as you have been told time and again that in this field of law I am supreme that is at least as far as this courtroom is concerned. Alright, let's read that. Were you saying ruling or ruling? Yeah, ruling. It's my R's. I have a hard time with my R's. You'll figure that out if we go along. In the high speed, they always make fun of me. Did you go to California? Yeah. Any problems with your R's? I've always had problems. I should have had speech I when I was younger. Are you the East Coast? <laughs> with the R problem? No, I'm a California girl. Never leaving either. They really have problems with their eyes. Sometimes they don't even say it at all. Yeah. Huh? New York. Yeah. Okay. How do they say New York? How do they say New York? Do they say what? <laughs> <laughs> well, they probably say Ulings or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. A lot of times they just have a problem. They don't have a problem with beginning art. It's that, you know, like we taught. They say mm -hmm, right. right now, like, uh, you know. Yeah. They got the um, long the long vowel R's. Right. Well, the Japanese also have problems with their R's. Yes, they do. 
No, um, when I was 11, my family moved to Japan, um, and we lived there for almost three years, so um, they made us learn it in school. It was international school, and you had to take it. So, okay, here we go. This is two boys. Karen, how old are you? I am 16. Do you go to school? Yes, I am in high school. Will you tell us where you were on June 18? I was at a summer camp with Marilyn and some other girls. What time did you arrive at that camp? I think it was about noon. Was there a group of girls arriving at the same time? Yes, we all came together. We were on the same bus. Do you remember the first time you met Marilyn? Yes, we were assigned to a group of 10 girls with a counselor. That was the first time you met Marilyn. Is that correct? That's correct. About how old was Marilyn? She was 14. Were all the girls in your group assigned rooms in the same cottage? Yes, we were. I show you exhibit one and ask you whether that is a photograph of your cottage and the beach. Yes, it is. I show you exhibit two and ask you whether there is a ladder from the water to the platform in this photograph. I don't see the ladder, but I know where it should be. What was the cottage you were assigned to known as? It was known as the casino. How many feet did the casino extend over the water at, say, high tide. I would say about 25 feet. Let's try that one again. <clears throat>
at that camp. I think it was about noon. Was there a group of girls arriving at the same time? Yes, we all came together. We were on the same bus. Do you remember the first time you met Marilyn? Yes, we were assigned to a group of 10 girls with a counselor. That was the first time you met Marilyn. Is that correct? That's correct. About how old was Marilyn? She was 14. Were all the girls in your group assigned rooms in the same cottage? Yes, we were. I show you exhibit one and ask you whether that is a photograph of your cottage and the beach. Yes, it is. I show you exhibit two and ask you whether there is a ladder from the water to the platform in this photograph. I don't see the ladder, but I know where it should be. What was the cottage you were assigned to known as? It was known as the casino. How many feet did the casino extend over the water at, say, high tide? I would say about 25 feet. All right, let's try that one one more time. Karen, how old are you? I am 16. Do you go to school? Yes, I am in high school. Will you tell us where you were on June 18? I was at a summer camp with Marilyn and some other girls. What time did you arrive at that camp? I think it was about noon. Was there a group of girls arriving at the same time? We were all coming together. We were on the same bus. Do you remember the first time you met Marilyn? Yes, we were assigned to a group of 10 girls with a counselor. That was the first time you met Marilyn. Is that correct? That's correct. About how old was Marilyn? She was 14. Were all the girls in your group assigned rooms in the same cottage? Yes, we were. I show you exhibit one and ask you whether that is a photograph of your cottage and the beach. Yes, it is. I show you exhibit two and ask you whether there is a ladder from the water to the platform in this photograph. I don't see the ladder, but I know where it should be. What was the cottage you were assigned to known as? It was known as the casino. How 
many feet did the casino extend over the water at, say, high tide? I would say about 25 feet. Is there a walk beside the casino jutting out into the water? Yes, there is. Was there anything beyond the walk extending into the water? There were rocks there. This accident happened about four o'clock in the afternoon, didn't it? Yes. About when before that did the group meet? It was about two o'clock, right after lunch. Was there a counselor present at that time? No. She came in later on. Will you tell us what she said? She asked us what we would like to do. Four of the girls said they would like to go swimming. The rest of us wanted to write letters. Was Marilyn one of the girls who wanted to go swimming? Yes, she was. Immediately before the accident, where were you? I was writing letters in the casino. Was there anybody with you? Yes, Sandy was with me. Karen, just how were you writing? I was curled up in a chair. From the position you describe, could you look out the window? Yes. There was an accident was there not? Yes. What did you see immediately before the accident? Did you see anybody in the water? Yes, there were a few girls in the water. Was Marilyn one of them? Yes. What did you see her do? Not at the time of the accident, but before. She was motioning to me to watch her, so I did. Is there a walk beside the casino jutting out into the water? Yes, there is. Was there anything beyond the walk extending into the water? There were rocks there. This accident happened about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, didn't it? Yes, about when before that?
did the group meet? It was about 2 o'clock right after lunch. Was there a counselor present at that time? No. She came in later on. Will you tell us what she said? She asked us what we would like to do. Four of the girls said they would like to go swimming. The rest of us wanted to write letters. Was Marilyn one of the girls who wanted to go swimming? Yes, she was. Immediately before the accident, where were you? I was writing letters in the casino. Was there anybody with you? Yes, Sandy was with me. Karen, just how were you writing? I was curled up in a chair. From the position you described, could you look out the window? Yes. There was an accident, was there not? Yes. What did you see immediately before the accident? Did you see anybody in the water? Yes, there were a few girls in the water. Was Marilyn one of them? Yes. What did you see her do? Not at the time of the accident, but before. She was motioning to me to watch her, so I did. Okay, let's try the whole thing. Okay, ready? <clears throat> Karen, how old are you? I am 16. Do you go to school? Yes, I am in high school. Will you tell us where you were on June 18? I was at a summer camp with Marilyn and some other girls. What time did you arrive at that camp? I think it was about noon. Was there a group of girls arriving at the same time? Yes, we all came together. We were on the same bus. Do you remember the first time you met Marilyn? Yes, we were assigned to a group of 10 girls with a counselor. That was the first time you met Marilyn. Is that correct? That's correct. About how old was Marilyn? She was 14. Were all the girls in your group assigned rooms in the same cottage? Yes, we were. I show you exhibit one and ask you whether that is a photograph of your cottage and the beach. Yes, it is. I show you exhibit two and ask you whether there is a ladder from the water to the platform in this photograph. I don't see the ladder but I know where it should be. What was the cottage you were assigned to known as? It was known as the casino. How many feet did the casino extend over the water at, say, high tide? I would say about 25 feet. Is there a walk beside the casino jutting out into the water? Yes, 
there is. Executives are fat and thin, tall and short, bald and heavy thatched, clean shaven and bearded. In fact, they look like other men who are not business leaders. What makes them different? Most leaders in fields other than industrial management have a specific talent or high intellectual ability. The management leader has, however, more than a particular skill and high intelligence. He also has administrative competence and the power to make men follow him because of personal attributes. Let's take the personal qualities first. He is intelligent. He thinks clearly and concisely about its business and its problems. Decisiveness is a part of this intellectual ability. He makes up his mind, then acts, not out of stubbornness, but because his decisions are based on sound judgment, after all the facts are discovered and reviewed. Let's try that one again. Let's try that one again. Good executives are fat and thin, tall and short, bald and heavy thatched, clean shaven and bearded. In fact, they look like other men who are not business leaders. What makes them different? Most leaders in fields other than industrial management have a specific talent or high intellectual ability. The management leader has, however, more than a particular skill and high intelligence. He also has administrative competence and the power to make men follow him because of personal attributes. Let's take the personal qualities first. He is intelligent. He thinks clearly and concisely about his 
business and its problems. Decisiveness is a part of this intellectual ability. He makes up his mind, then acts, not out of stubbornness, but because his decisions are based on sound judgment. After all, the facts are discovered and reviewed. Okay, one more time on this one. Good executives are fat and thin, tall and short, bald and heavy thatched, clean shaven and bearded. In fact, they look like other men who are not business leaders. What makes them different? Most leaders in fields other than industrial management have a specific talent or high intellectual ability. The management leader has, however, more than a particular skill and high intelligence. He also has administrative competence and the power to make men follow him because of personal attributes. Let's take the personal qualities first. He is intelligent. He thinks clearly and concisely about his business and its problems. Decisiveness is a part of this intellectual ability. He makes up his mind, then acts, not out of stubbornness, but because his decisions are based on sound judgment. After all the facts are discovered and reviewed. Try another one. of the plaintiff 
in the nature of a reply in which plaintiff simply denies each and all the allegations and statements made and contained in defendant's answer which are neither denied nor admitted in plaintiff's petition. So it is from these pleadings members of the jury together with the evidence in the case that we determine the issues. The issues are the disputed questions of fact and are for you to determine from the evidence under the law and given you by the court. One more time on this one. So these pleadings, members of the jury, make up the issues. By the way, this answer of the defendant has called for a further pleading on behalf of the plaintiff in the nature of a reply in which plaintiff simply denies each and all the allegations and statements made and contained in defendant's answer which are neither denied nor admitted in plaintiff's petition. So it is from these pleadings, members of the jury, together with the evidence in the case that we determine the issues. The issues are the disputed questions of fact and are for you to determine from the evidence under the law as given you by the court. Okay, let's try a different one. Now, as you have already sensed from the reference to the pleadings, this is an action seeking to recover the amount of $5,000 and interest represented by a note and mortgage executed by Henry O. Johnson and delivered to the defendant for a specified purpose as claimed by the plaintiff to wit to be deposited with the superintendent of insurance to establish or to help establish the necessary fund to qualify the defendant company to proceed with its proposed issuing of policies of insurance upon the lives of individuals. Try that one again. So these pleadings, members of the jury, make up the issues by the way this answer of the defendant has called for a further pleading on behalf of the plaintiff in the nature of a reply in which plaintiff simply denies each and all the allegations and statements made and 
contained in defendant's answer, which are neither denied nor admitted in plaintiff's petition. So it is from these pleadings, members of the jury, together with the evidence in the case, that we determine the issues. The issues are the disputed questions of fact and are for you to determine from the evidence under the law as given you by the court. Now, as you have already sensed from the reference to the pleadings, this is an action seeking to recover the amount of $5,000 and interest represented by a note and mortgage executed by Henry O. Johnson and delivered to the defendant for a specified purpose as claimed by the plaintiff to wit to be deposited with the superintendent of insurance to establish or to help establish the necessary fund to qualify the defendant company to proceed with its proposed issuing of policies of insurance upon the lives of individuals. It is claimed by the plaintiff that there was an agreement between her deceased husband and the defendant company that within five years this note and mortgage was to be returned canceled and satisfaction entered of record. Defendant denies this claim of the plaintiff and alleges that the note and mortgage were given by the plaintiff's deceased husband in payment for stock in the defendant company and that the delivery of stock was and became the consideration for this note and mortgage and in effect claims that it thereby became a closed transaction and that they owe the plaintiff nothing. Sister. Okay, we've got two points. Did you discuss with them the fact that you had been called down to view a lineup? Not that I recall. Did you ask them if they had been called down to view a lineup? I am sure we probably mentioned it, but I don't really recall. Do you recall telling either of the boys that you had identified someone? Yes, I probably did. Could you tell us what kind of pants the robber was wearing? No, I cannot. Mrs. Kendall, I am still not clear about the type of jacket you are talking about. Are you talking about the type 
that is worn by subject number two in the lineup? No. That is just a shirt. I am talking about a bulky type plaid shirt. My sons have jackets like this. It is a type that young people are wearing now. I think it is called a shirt jacket. Did you approximate an age when you talked to the police? I beg your pardon. Did you tell the police about an approximate age? I thought I did.
I think it is called a shirt jacket. Did you approximate an age when you talked to the police? I beg your pardon? Did you tell the police about an approximate age? I thought I did. A little bit faster. Did you discuss with them the fact that you had been called down to view a lineup? Not that I recall. Did you ask them if they had been called down to view a lineup? I am sure we probably mentioned it, but I don't really recall. Do you recall telling either of the boys that you had identified someone? Yes, I probably did. Could you tell us what kind of pants the robber was wearing? No. I cannot. Mrs. Kendall, I am still not clear about the type of jacket you are talking about. Are you talking about the type that is worn by subject number two in the lineup? No, that is just a shirt. I am talking about a bulky type plaid shirt. My sons have jackets like this. It is a type that young people are wearing now. I think it is called a shirt jacket. Did you approximate an age when you talked to the police, I beg your pardon, did you tell the police about an approximate age? I thought I did. <clears throat> okay, enough of those numbers. Now, let's try um, what's police feel? Yes. What is that is correct? T H A R K, right? <clears throat> Statement, one stroke. How about lineup? Lineup. Two strokes. Okay. Police department? Left. Elevator? Later? Just later? Yeah. Okay, let's try it. Do you remember what you said? If I remember correctly, I said it was in the 20s. From the time you left the store after the robbery, until you came to the police department on November 16, did you have any contact with the police? No. Beg pardon? No. Other than the phone call requesting you to come down, that is correct. No one ever came and took a statement from you? No. When you viewed the lineup, were other persons present? There were other persons viewing the same lineup. I wasn't there alone. 
did you and those persons talk? We were told not to discuss the lineup. Did you all view the same lineup? Yes. At the same time? Yes, but in different little cubicles. Where did you meet these people? In the courthouse. In the robbery division of the police department? I think that is correct. And then you were taken together into an elevator and upstairs to a room where you viewed the lineup? Yes. <coughs> Do you remember what you said? If I remember correctly, I said it was in the 20s. From the time you left the store after the robbery until you came to the police department on November 6th, did you have any contact with the police? No. <clears throat> Beg pardon? No. Other than the phone call requesting you to come down, that is correct. No one ever came and took a statement from you? No. When you viewed the lineup, were other persons present? There were other persons viewing the same lineup. I wasn't there alone. Did you and those persons talk? We were told not to discuss the lineup. Did you all view the same Line up? Yes. At the same time? Yes, but in different little cubicles. When did you meet these people? In the courthouse. In the robbery division of the police department? I think that is correct. And then you were taken together into an elevator and upstairs to a room where you viewed the lineup? Yes. <clears throat> okay, one more time. Do you remember what you said? If I remember correctly, I said it was in the 20s from the time you left the store after the robbery until you came to the police department on November 16. Did you have any contact with the police? No. Beg pardon? No other than the phone call requesting you to come down? That is correct. No one ever came and took a statement from you? No. When you viewed the lineup, were other persons present? There were other persons viewing the same lineup.
Okay, you guys ready?